Good afternoon. Welcome to the first official day of spring. My name is Rich Milner, and I'm the Helen Faison Professor of Urban Education and the director of the center. Are you able to hear me? And better now, OK. Uh, and director of the Center for Urban Education at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Here at Q, our vision is to be a space of learning and sharing with communities to positively transform educational opportunities and experiences. To better work towards this vision, we adhere to a list of six core beliefs. We believe in learning and relationships and assets and sharing and equity and action. One of the ways we try to create transformative experiences is through our biannual Q Talks lecture series, which we are so glad and excited to see you here for today. As we welcome Dr. Lisa Delpit to the University of Pittsburgh. You know, this is so much tougher than just talking about your research, right? They give me a script that I have to follow. Okay. We also hope you'll stay with us after Dr. Delpit's talk for a brief Q&A session, then join us in honoring three outstanding contributors to urban education with the Alan Lesko Award for Excellence in Urban Education. Our recipients this year, Provost Patricia Beeson, the PRIDE program, all right, all right. And One Nation are true champions of this work. All right, you can give it up for them. We do a lot of work at Q, from original research to professional development for pre and in-service educators. But at the end of the day, we do this work to improve students' educational opportunities. And we like to include students whenever possible to hear and honor their voices and talents. Among our favorite Q traditions, we invite student artists, writers, poets, musicians, and dancers to join us at each lecture to showcase their talents. So now I'd like to invite over Dr. Dick, almost doctor. Uh, I'll see Derek, get ready for it. Claim it, brother, claim it. Mr. Derek Hitt, one of our graduate students here at Q to introduce today's performers. Please give Derek a hand as he makes his way forward. Dr. Milner is a soothsayer, so I believe what he says will be true, and I appreciate him for the guidance that will make it such, so thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, and braving the snow. I say let it snow. Um, it didn't deter you, so we're happy to have you here. Urban Prep, originally founded in 1998 as the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh Charter School, the now independent Urban Academy of Greater Pittsburgh Charter School was an early pioneer in the Pittsburgh School Choice Movement and has served as a beacon of hope and opportunity for thousands of students and families, the vast majority of whom come from underserved communities across Allegheny County. With a long and distinguished history of being one of the district's top performing schools and of eliminating the racial achievement gap, particularly in third through fifth grade literacy, Urban Academy has consistently delivered on its mission. It is now under the direction of Kay Chase Patterson, and since its rebirth in 2015, under a new name, a new board of trustees, and newly enhanced building with 10,000 additional square feet, the school has honored its legacy of Afrocentric pedagogy, now reframed as black to the core, and excellence without compromise. At the start of the 2018-2019 school year, the Urban Academy is excited to cut the ribbon on its new stream and family first centers. The stream center will focus on science, technology, robotics, engineering, the arts, and math, while the Family First Center will focus on establishing the school as a community hub that serves the workforce, family support, and social service needs of the families with the Urban Academy community. 
Now, without further ado, I'd like you to give a wonderful applause in anticipation for the excellence with which they will render their service. Please come forward, young people. Come on forward. Take a bow, take a bow. Chase. Chase. Stay here for a second. Chase, if you would, if you would please come forward. please. True to the words of the song, we in this room have gathered in order to hear from Dr. Dale Pitt so that we can march on till victory is won in every school, whether it be charter, private, or traditional public. So we thank you, children, for inspiring us through your song to keep doing the work that makes education better for all children. Thank you. I want to read this certificate of appreciation on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh Center for Urban Education. We thank you. Urban Academy of Greater Pittsburgh for sharing your talents with us at the spring 2018 Q Lecture Series, Tuesday, March 20, 2018. Thank you very much from Dr. Rich Milner and the rest of the Q team. Thank you, almost Dr. Hitt. And, th and thank you, students. Thank you for an outstanding uh, performance. I know we're not in a Baptist church, but I I'm going to ask just one more time. Just give them a round, round of applause so they can hear you demonstrate your appreciation. I also want to, uh, to acknowledge uh, Dean uh, Valerie Kenlock. She's just come in, so I'm going to ask for uh, Dean Kenlock to stand and be recognized, if you will. Come on up to the front where you belong. <laughs> if you have not had the opportunity to meet our dean, I want you to see her. Uh, don't come up to her all at once after the uh, present after the uh, Delphi's talk, but we do hope you know who she is, and we are so excited to have you at the University of Pittsburgh and in the Pittsburgh community. I want to take a minute to acknowledge all the people who help keep Q going, including Dean Kenlock. Thank you, especially to the Heinz Endowments. Uh, for generously supporting the work we do. And because people are integral to the work we do at the Center for Urban Education, I want to acknowledge some folks who support us in extraordinarily 
important ways. We work with an incredibly talented group of faculty and graduate student fellows. Uh, graduate student and faculty fellows, if you're here in the audience, please stand so that we might recognize you. Graduate student and faculty fellows of the uh, Center for Urban Education, please stand. Thank you. You know, at the end of the day, this work is not about one person. This is the Center for Urban, Ed this is the University of Pittsburgh S School of Education Center for Urban Education. And so I've, I've really tried to propel that message throughout our time. And because of our faculty and graduate student fellows, it's very clear uh, of their participation uh, and their uh, commitments and contributions uh, to the work we do. So thank you, graduate and faculty uh, fellows. The Heinz Fellows are here today. This is the Heinz Fellows' first year at Q. Uh, we uh, were honored and are honored to sort of take on the, the leadership of the project uh, from Duquesne University. And this class of fellows is doing outstanding work through the Pittsburgh uh, community. Heinz Fellows, all over the building, please stand so that we might recognize you, the current group of Heinz Fellows. Look at you. Look at him. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Have a seat. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for what you do. You know, I, I say it often, but I want to just say it publicly how grateful I am to each of you for all the work you do uh, on behalf of our students. I know you're working overtime, you're committed to the work, uh, and I just want to say personally and I want to say publicly uh, how grateful I am to you for all you do. Uh, if there are any urban scholars in the audience that we support, Please stand and be recognized. Any urban scholars? Any urban scholars in the house? Okay. Stand up. Stand up so we can see you. They're too shy to stand. Okay. There, there they are. All right. <laughs> Stephanie, come on up. We have seats. Come on. Uh, I would like to also give a special and, and to, to acknowledge and, and for you to give a special round of applause to every elementary, middle, and high school student uh, in the audience. If you're an elementary school, middle, or high school student, please stand and be recognized so that we might recognize you. The adults, y'all should be on your feet. You should be on your feet celebrating these young folk. Thank you. As I think about, someone asked me earlier if I had written about or if I had really thought about how we've been able to do the work uh, in the Center for Urban Education. You know, I've not, I've not really sort of sat down and sort of systemically tried to investigate and study what we've been able to do. It's been a very, uh, you know, uh, challenging but rewarding in so many ways um, journey throughout my time here at the University of Pittsburgh. But one of the things I know for sure and that we've done deliberately is I've really tried to create a space such that faculty and community members and family members and students all come together and engage in a discursive dialogue or discursive ways to be able to propel the work. At the end of the day, one entity, right, can't do it alone. We've got to work together, right? And I hope you believe, I hope you see that when we work together, we can actually accomplish uh, so much. If you're a college, high school or middle school student who participates in our Ready to Learn uh, program, please stand. Please stand. Ready to Learn middle, high school, college student. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few Ready to Learn high school students or high school scholars. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, and their mentors here today. The seniors listed here on the board have been part of the program all throughout their four years of high school. And we're excited that they all plan on continuing their education at institutions of higher learning next academic year. You can clap for that, y'all. RTL seniors, you've become an important part of the Q family. You know, we do far more than give a lecture. I just want to be clear, right? I just want to be clear about that, right? 
we're out there trying to do the work. We really are. Uh, and we have a little surprise for the RTL. Y'all like, what is he doing? I'm snapping. That's what the young folks do when they like to. Uh, we have a little surprise for you, for all the RTL seniors. Uh, we, you will be receiving a custom-built Dell laptop uh, over the next coming weeks. So uh, you can clap for that as well. <laughs> We want to, we want to send you off uh, as you make the transition into high into, from high school into college with the resources you need to be successful. Uh, and just please know that we are a continual, we will be continual, a continual support for you uh, as you matriculate and as you make the transition uh, into higher education. So stay tuned, that's coming. And finally, to the Q team, to the Center for Urban Education uh, leadership team. Please stand uh, all over the building or wave your hand uh, if you're working. I'm sure most of you are. Uh, if you are a core member of the leadership team of the Center for Urban Education, please stand. As Becky claps. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, I have very high expectations, and uh, I can say for sure that what we've been able to accomplish in the Center for Urban Education is nothing short of the collective efforts of those folks, these folks standing around the room. And I consistently thank them. I consistently make it clear to them I hope uh, how appreciative I am. But if you knew, if you just had a, just a, a second of reflection in, in the life worlds, uh, phenomenologically speaking, uh, of, of the students with whom, or the, or the folks with whom I work, you would know that these folks give of their time, their efforts, their talents uh, in ways that I have never experienced in my, uh, in my career. And so I just want to say to each one of you how grateful I am. Each of you is important to me. You is important. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, each of you has such, uh, uh, you've, you've impacted me in really, 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 powerful and extraordinary ways. And so as I think about your work and moving forward to our doctoral students and to our faculty and to our staff, uh, I know that the best truly is yet to come. This work in the Center for Urban Education is about the fabric. I wanted to make sure that the center was a part of the very fabric of the University of Pittsburgh. And I feel confident uh, that uh, you truly are. So thank you again for all you do. Please know I do not take you for granted and I'm very thankful to you for your commitment uh, to the work. I know Dr. Delpin is like, when am I coming? Just give me a second. All right, so uh, before we make that quick transition, I want to invite uh, to the front uh, Dr. Erica Gold Kestenberg. Would you please come forward, please, Dr. Erica Gold Kestenberg? <laughs> so each year, uh, I'm able to sort of take some executive privilege uh, and recognize an outstanding uh, contributor to our space. And uh, this year, uh, one of the outstanding service awards goes to Dr. Erica Gold Kestenberg. When I started my work at the center five years ago, uh, it, was, it was Erica and me, right? And so I'm very grateful to you uh, for your loyalty, your hard work, and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd also uh, like to invite Lori DeLaley O'Connor to the front. And so uh, Lori receives the second outstanding uh, service award. Lori is the best colleague I've ever had. And uh, she is ethical. Uh, she's courageous. She's smart. She's hardworking. And she's literally the best colleague 
I've ever worked with in my entire career. And so I just want to say to you how grateful I am uh, to you for all you do. And I'm looking forward to following that career. Now I'm all crying up and all that stuff. Lisa Delpit is an internationally known writer and scholar whose work focuses on the education of children of color and perspectives, aspirations, and pedagogy of teachers of color. She serves as the Felton G. Clark Distinguished Professor of Education at Southern University and has authored dozens of publications, including Other People's Children and Multiplication is for White People. Let me just be clear here. that There was a very deliberate move on my part to invite Lisa Delpit here as, our, as my culminating lecturer uh, uh, through the center. When I read Other People's Children as a doctoral student at the, that's right, I said it, the Ohio State University, <laughs> uh, it literally changed, it stopped me at my core. It, it hit me in my core. My, you know, I, I stopped and I, and I reflected and, I, and, and it really challenged me to rethink the questions I posed and the ways in which I sort of thought about uh, the work I do. And so I think I've never met Lisa Del Pitt personally, but I can say for sure that through your work, you have changed me. And I'm hoping that my work uh, and the work we do is emancipatory and transformative transformative in a very similar way. Dr. Del Pitt describes her strongest focus on finding ways and means to best educate marginalized students, particularly African American and other students of color. She holds a bachelor's degree from Antioch College and an MED and EDD from Harvard University. Her background is in elementary education with an emphasis on language and literacy development. She has used her training in ethnographic research to speak to spark dialogues between educators on issues of the impact uh, of students who are placed at the greatest disadvantage. Dr. Delpit is particularly interested in teaching and learning in multicultural societies and has studied these issues across the world. Her work on school community relations and cross-cultural communications was cited as a contributor to her receiving and MacArthur Genius Award. We got a genius in the house, y'all. Say genius, 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 genius. <laughs> Dr. Delpit's recent work includes projects on assisting, assisting urban school districts engaged in school restructuring efforts, developing innovative alternative teacher education programs in urban education and teacher leadership. Founding the Post-Katrina National Coalition for Quality Education in New Orleans, assisting in the creation of high standards, innovative schools for low-income st income students, and developing leadership programs for principals and school district staff. We are delighted to have Dr. Del Pitt with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm University of Pittsburgh welcome to Professor Lisa Del Pitt. just told Rich he was going to make me cry, too, if he <laughs> kept it up. Um, I think, I hope what I talk about today will give us some clue about why these young people were so, are so successful and why so many more of our young people could be successful. They are apparently, from what I just heard, scoring and very high in everything that they do in terms of test scores. But the other piece of what they're doing is they are figuring out and being led to understand who they are. So in this age of creating more rigorous content with Common Core or whatever else people are using, uh, whatever any particular state is calling it, 
and greater accountability, high stakes testing. I've been thinking about something else, mainly the power of our country's stories and the personal beliefs they engender about its performance. I want to start with a set of quotations that have influenced our country's stories and subsequently become a part of our national heritage. <clears throat> a black after hard labor through the day will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up till midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. They are more ardent after their female, but love seems with them to be more an eager desire than a tender, delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient, afflictions are less felt, and sooner forgotten with them. In general, their existence appears to participate to more of sensation than reflection. I advance, therefore, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. Uh, if you know who said that, would you raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah. Got a few hands. That was uh, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> you knew that. Yep. One of the awardees knew that. That's why she's getting that award. <laughs> uh, here's another one. Black and other ethnic minority children are uneducable beyond the nearest rudiments of training. No amount of school instruction will ever make them capable citizens, and their dullness appears to be racial. Children of this group should be segregated into special classes and be given instruction which is concrete and practical. They cannot master abstractions, but they can be made efficient workers. Oops, sorry. There is no possibility at present of convincing society that they should not be allowed to reproduce although from a eugenic point of view, they constitute a grave problem because of their prolific breeding. Now that quote was, uh, Thomas Jefferson of course was the 1700s. This quote is from uh, 1916, Lewis Terman. Lewis Terman was the Stanford University, uh, Stanford University researcher and professor and former president of the American Psychological Association. The interesting thing about Lewis Terman is that he actually wrote many of the, the texts that were used in colleges for many, many years, even after, certainly after 1916. So a lot of the folk who became instructors and teachers and psychologists were trained uh, by folk who had been trained by Lewis Terman. And finally, if you wanted to reduce crime, you could, if that were your sole purpose, you could abort every black baby in this country and your crime rate would go down. Anybody know who that was? Okay, that was in 2005 by William Bennett, the former U.S. Secretary of Education in the Reagan administration on his radio show Morning in America. So these quotes represent a story and a belief system that is still alive and well in our society. And most of us have been affected by this belief system because we are members of this country's culture. Whether we, we don't, I doubt if anybody in this room consciously believes that these quotes or these ideas but it doesn't matter because recent research has indicated that 80 to 90 percent of our daily brain activity is subconscious. Most of what we do is a result of subconscious physiological functioning or subconscious psychological programming. Author Beverly Tatum talks about how people become smog breeders. If we live in Los Angeles, she says, we are smog breeders. We don't do anything to become smog breeders. We don't try to become smog breeders. We, we just go about our everyday lives and we breathe smog. She then adds, if we live in the United States, we are racism breeders, and it doesn't matter what color we are. And I need to stress that. We don't try to be. We aren't usually conscious of the racism we breathed. We just go about our regular lives. Indeed, uh, according to a recent report issued by Stanford University's Recruitment to Expand Diversity and Excellence Program, the implicit attitude test 
um, which you can take yourself online, I think at Harvard, let me see what it is, Harvard, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, implicit.harvard.edu. Uh, it purportedly tests for subconscious racial preferences, and it found that 75% of whites and Asians demonstrated an implicit bias for whites over blacks. But hold on, black folk, close to 30% of black participants also demonstrated an implicit bias for whites over blacks. It's sort of like those uh, Kenneth Clark, we haven't moved far from the Cl Kenneth Clark doll, baby doll, where the black children were choosing white baby dolls. But it's all because of this story that is embedded in our sub subconscious. We are so unconscious of these realities that we seldom see how even our language is embedded with racist overtones. I'm gonna share, uh, Daniel is gonna help me read, I'm gonna share a tongue-in-cheek essay from, a Rob, from Robert Moore on racism in the English language. Some may blackly, angrily accuse him of trying to blacken, defame the English language, to give it a black eye, a mark of shame, by writing such black words, hostile. They may denigrate to cast aspirations, aspersions to darken him by accusing him of being black-hearted, malevolent, of having a black outlook, pessimistic, dismal on life, of being a blackguard, a scoundrel, which would certainly be a black mark, a detrimental fa fact against him. Some may black brow, black brow scowl at him and hope that a black cat crosses in front of him because of this black deed. He may become a black sheep, one who causes shame or embarrassment because of deviation from the accepted standards, who will be blackballed, ostracized, by being placed on a blacklist, a list of undesirables, an attempt to blackmail, to force a coerce into a particular action, him to retract his words. But attempts to blackjack, to compel by threat, him will have a Chinaman's chance of success, for he is not yellow-bellied Indian giver of words who will whitewash, cover up, or gloss over vices or crimes, a black lie, harmful, inexcusable. He challenges the purity and innocence, white, of the English language. He doesn't see things in black and white, entirely bad or entirely good terms, for he is a white man marked by upright firmness, if there ever was one. However, it would be a black day when he would not call a spade a spade, even though some will suggest a, a white man calling the English language racist is like the pot calling the kettle black. While many may be niggardly, grudging, and scanty in their support, others will be honest and decent. And to them, he says, that's very white of you, honest and decent. Now, uh, Robert was doing a tongue-in-cheek essay about the notion that even our language is embedded and we have no, we have no clue. We just go about our daily lives. Uh, one group of researchers also analyzed a database that contained books, magazines, and articles that the average college-educated American would read over his or her lifetime. They found, according to Dr. David R. Williams, a public health researcher and a professor at Harvard, this is recent research, when the word black appears in American culture, what co-occurs with it are words like poor, violent, religious, lazy, and dangerous. When white occurs, the most frequent co-occurring words are wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, and educated. Another example of how words are used, um, yeah, these, you can't see it very clearly, but this is an African-American man, and this was published after Katrina. A young man walks through Chet's deep blood waters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday. And these are two white individuals, and the uh, text read, the uh, two residents wade through Chet's deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, I will tell you that some folk attacked the writer saying that he was racist consciously racist. I would suggest that he is not consciously racist. He actually had, he was so embedded with, he was not careful, but he was so embedded with the story that our country tells that that was a natural go-to, the idea of putting looting when it had to do with a young black man and finding when it had to do uh, with white citizens. So my question is, what would the belief system of the country look like if we were inundated with stories not based on a litany of presumed deficiencies, but on information expressing the true genius of people of color? 
information not typically brought to light in our country's storybook. Uh, the few, the examples I'm going to, one set of examples I'm going to give are from this classic reference by Marcel Jabet. Now, the, you're not going to be able to see the slides very clearly. If it were darker, we might be able to, but they're, they're very, very old, taken from a very, very old journal that I'm going to show a little later. In 1956, French researcher Marcel Jabet, under a research grant from the United Nations Children's Fund, traveled to Africa in order to study the effects of malnutrition on uh, infant and child development. She concentrated on Kenya and Uganda, and she made what she thought was a momentous discovery. Despite the expectation that malnutrition would cause lower rates of infant development, the developmental rate of Ugandan native infants was so much higher than the established norm that they were, to, they were able to outperform European children twice or three times their age. She found, in her words, the most precocious and advanced infants ever observed anywhere in the world. And keep in mind, these were children they were expecting to be developmentally delayed. The Ugandan infants were months ahead of children of European descent on any intelligence scale used. For example, based on the Giselle test for early intelligence developed at Yale, Jabe showed infants between six and seven months a toy, then walked across the room and put the toy into a tall toy box. Uh, the, African -American ch the African children would leap up, run across the room, reach into the basket, and retrieve the toy. Now, if any of you know about uh, child development, that is a very high level to most children of that age. But if, it's, if they don't see it, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. So this was not only extraordinary sensory motor skill of walking and retrieval. At six months, these children were running across the room. The text showed that object permanency had occurred in the children's developing mind, the first great shift of logical processing. And these are some of the slides of those children, I said they, you won't be able to see them well. This is an African infant, five months old, uh, doing a foam bo form board, as they called it, which was like a puzzle, versus 11 months old for European children. African infant, seven months old, walking to the box and looking in it for the toy, versus 15 months for the European children. African infant, 11 months old, climbing stairs alone versus 15 months for the European kids. Uh, I'll go on and show you this. I'll just show you this briefly, but this is a comparison of achievement test scores in language with Cuba and other countries in Latin America. And uh, Ms. Viz Brown Tricky this morning talked about Cuba and the fact that it's a poor country and yet everybody's literate. These are all um, Central, uh, well, Latin American uh, countries, uh, South American countries, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Honduras, Mexico, Paraguay, uh, Dominican Republic, and Venezuela. Many of these countries, the percentage of children of African descent is very, very, very low, like 1% to 5%. And yet, these countries' uh, scores are so much lower than Cuba, which has uh, children of African descent, about 70% of the children there are of some African descent. I point this out to you so that clearly it is not a case of the children's ethnicity or racial background. The difference is what the country commits to. In our, uh, in Cuba, when an African, when a, a black mother, teenage unmarried mother, I'm told, has a baby, the government sends a letter thanking her for contributing a citizen. Now, compare that to what happens in this country if a black unmarried teenage mother has a baby. What messages are we giving to all of our children. So I'm going to move on to the 1960s uh, in the U.S. Pediat 
pediatric researchers Frankenberg and Dodds, after crunching numbers on thousands of American babies, also found the same pattern in African American children. They outperformed Europe, uh, children of European descent on every cognitive and motor task available. Then even more recently in 2006, now I don't have more research to share with you because folk are doing the research uh, or nobody's publishing it, one of the two. Uh, in 2006, in her dissertation, Phyllis Riffiong looked at the scores of African American and white infants on the Bailey Infant Scale of Development. She found that black infants got higher cognitive skill scores and considerably higher motor skill scores. In other words, she found that if black and white babies were born with the same degree of good health, black babies would surpass whites on all aspects of the Bailey scale. Thus, you have a situation um, which no one talks about, that the pediatric scales that P uh, pediatricians use actually are not normed predominantly on African American children. So if an African American child shows up normal on one of those scales, that child really may have some developmentally delays, developmental delays because they should be expected to outperform. So what might we American citizens of all colors think about the capacity of African American children if this data were in the national consciousness? What might be our subconscious go-to story when we looked at a classroom of, Af of African American children? What might African American children think of themselves? Clearly there is no achievement gap at birth, at least not one favoring children of European ancestry. Performance tend begins to equalize around age four and then starts to go, around, go in the other direction around age five. What else happens around age five? Something to think about. I'm not suggesting that is necessarily causal, but we need to think about this is one of the first times that children are getting information about who they are and what they can do outside uh, of their home setting. I want to talk mostly today about the consequences of the stories we do tell ourselves as, Afri as Americans about African Americans and other marginalized individuals. What do they mean for a diverse society? What do they mean for national education policies. I'm going to uh, pull greatly from the work by uh, Claude Steele. How many of you are familiar with Claude Steele's work? Good, a number of you are. Um, and he, his recent book called, relatively recent, Whistling Vivaldi, he says that cultural stories tell us who we are, who others are, and how we fit into a given society. The subtitle of Steele's book is How Stereotypes Affect Us and What We Can Do. Uh, the book, Whistling Vivaldi, is called that because it, he has a story by um, uh, Brent Staples, who was a University of Chicago graduate student who was walking around in the college clothes and he kept hearing, seeing people pull back, hold their purses, walk to the other side of the street and he was trying to be friendly and be nice and the more he tried the more he, he felt he was scaring them to death so he started trying to avoid people uh, and it wasn't until out of real nervousness he started whistling um, and he started, he found he was good at it, whistling uh, Vivaldi, the Beatles and Vivaldi and then when he did that, people just start, would smile at him and nod. So what did he do by doing that? I would suggest he gave them another story that, oh, he's one of us. So what are some of the stereotypes that affect uh, our society? How about women are biologically less gifted in mathematics than men? or the old one that people laugh about, white men can't jump, i.e. black people are more naturally talented in athletics. These are some of America's stories. So in Whistling Vivaldi, Steele shares a body of research that I think spectacularly shows just how the cultural stories we all breathe in radically affect performance in all manner of settings. Jeff Stone, a Princeton researcher, 
uh, did one of my favorite ones. He had white and black athletes from Princeton, and they were given a golf cast. They had to hit the ball into the hole. When told nothing, both groups performed equally. When half were told that the task was a test of natural athletic ability, the white students who were told it was a test of athletic ability scored significantly lower, averaging, uh, I think, needing about three or four more times to get the ball into the hole than white athletes who were told nothing and then the black athletes. When the response uh, is a result of stereotype threat, what he calls stereotype threat, about a cultural story that white people have less natural athletic ability. So once they were under, they were told that it was a test of natural uh, sports ability, the stereotype threat, the, the stereotype about quote, black men can't, uh, white men can't jump kicked in. Then a different set of black and white athletes were told that the golf test task was a test of sports strategic intelligence. And guess what happened? The black people scored lower, the black athletes scored lower on the test than the white students. They were now at risk of the stereotype threat of the cultural story that black people are less intelligent. About women, two groups of women and men who were high performers in math were given a difficult math test. The first group was told nothing and the women consistently and dramatically underperformed men. When they were told nothing, the assumption is that this is a test, this is a test of my ability in math. So they were operating under the stereotype threat of the belief that um, men will perform better on a ta test in math. In the second group, the women were told, you may have heard that women do more poorly on tests than men, but not on this test. This test has proven itself to equalize test scores for men and women. And lo and behold, the difference between male and male and female performance disappeared. And I don't know if you can see it, but the males were the dotted group, and this is the uh, high stereotype threat here in which they thought that uh, it was a test testing their ability. Low stereotype threat when they thought that this was, this was a test that uh, was equalized to make sure that women were able to, that women performed just as well. Same test, by the way. You can see the difference between what happened in those two settings. So the stories we are told in the larger culture and in a particular set setting radically affect the performance of students in test-taking situations. How does this all affect African-American students? This is where the research has made a significant point. Study after study conducted by a number of different researchers has shown that stereotype threat defined by Steele as the fear of confirming a negative stereotype held by the group with which one identifies has decreased the performance of African-American students significantly in all manner of assessment settings. The classic one was conducted by Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson. Black and white college students matched for ability were given a difficult language test. When black students were told nothing, they assumed the test was a measure of intellectual ability, as most tests are, and so were under the stereotype threat of the cultural story that black students perform more poorly on intellectual tests. And those black students did perform more poorly. In another group, the students were told explicitly that the exercise was not a measure of intellectual ability, but just a laboratory experiment to see how people solve linguistic problems. Thus, the stereotype was removed and because they weren't worried about fulfilling a negative stereotype. And sure enough, the black students in this group perform much better with no statistical difference between the black and white students. If you can see there. 
So Steele's fascinating book cites much research that shows that African Americans are affected by stereotype threat in many settings. At my institution, which is a predominantly uh, a historically black um, university, I was giving this information to my grad students, uh, all of whom in this class were African American. And one of the, the young women in the class, this was a grad class for people who wanted to become principals. And she said, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, it took me three times to pass the praxis test. Uh, and she said, I only passed it. I said, well, what happened when you passed it? She said, my grandmother told me to put that I was white instead of black when they asked for race. Now, grandma thought, and I'm not saying it's not true, that whoever was judging the test or assessing the test they were, they were racist, so therefore they might judge it differently if, she, if they knew she were black. That may be the case, but re really I think what's going on is she removed the stereotype threat because now she's not worried about um, confirming her, uh, her, the stereotype about black ability, and she was able to pass. I've subsequently found out that many of our African American students passing praxis or taking praxis do that as well which helps them, but now this, if you look at state statistics, it looks like black students don't pass praxis, only white students pass praxis. So I'm not sure what to do with that one, but it is interesting to see how this is even affecting uh, big policy issues. An interesting uh, question to me is, how does the phenomenon work for those under such threat? In a number of innovative experiments, researchers found that African Americans taking a test under stereotype threat had dramatically increased blood pressure rate readings and pulse rates even when they did not identify feeling anxious or concerned. So again, this is happening at the subconscious level. Looking at the specifics of what kinds of difficulties the stereotype threatened brain encounters, University of Arizona researchers Tony Schmader and Michael Johns found especially impaired working memory capacity. That is, there is little room to access working memory for anything else when stereotype threat is present. Anne Crindle and, and colleagues used MRI imaging technology to examine women's brains during stereotype threatening mathematics testing situations compared to non-stereotype threatening situations. They found that the brains of those not under stereotype threat fired in areas associated with mathematical learning, the prefrontal cortex. Those under threat, however, showed heightened brain activism in the neural regions associated with social and emotional processing, the amygdala and the um, uh, older brain. In other words, they were expending a lot of brain energy on dealing with the emotions of the setting. The authors say stereotype threat may direct women's attention toward the negative social and emotional consequences of a confirming negative stereotypes about their group, thereby increasing performance anxiety. Another researcher concluded uh, in another similar study, a mind trying to defeat stereotype threat leaves mental capa little mental capacity free for anything else we're doing. Ironically, I think the more pressure we put on students susceptible to stereotype to do well on a test, we may be further reducing their performance by increasing their anxiety. There's also a body of research by Dr. Maya McNeely from Duke University. Um, at the time she was Dr. Elizabeth Brandolo of uh, St. John University, Dr. Na Oyo Kwate from Rutgers, Dr. David R. Williams from the Harvard School of Public Health and increasing numbers of others that strongly suggest that the increased levels of heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes among African Americans is a direct result of the racially based negative encounters, many based not on direct intentional racism but on the subconscious cultural stories ever present in American society. Interesting, interestingly, these particular health issues are not found in Africans living in Africa. In addition, according to Dr. Kwate, a 2010 study identified symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder in students who not only experienced but merely witnessed racist incidents. 
the more vicarious incidents they experienced, the more signs of trauma. Even if the racist incident did not happen to the individual, if he or she is aware of it, they they're at risk for PTSD and all that implies in classrooms and communities. But let's return to the education uh, issue of education of students who have traditionally fared poorly in our schools at all levels. Stereotyping affects our educators as much as it affects our children. As a matter of fact, the stereotypes held by our teachers and educators as citizens of this country directly affects the stereotype threat that our students face. Educator bias begins with the youngest of our children. A recent Yale study shows that racial bias, particularly against black boys, leads to preschool teachers expecting black boys to misbehave, resulting in a 300% greater likelihood that they will be suspended than their white preschool classmates with the same behavior. And they tested this by showing videos of a preschool class, and these were the kids were actors, but the teacher's eyes tracked the black boys and rather than any of the other children. So they were actually looking and expecting behavior issues from those. This pattern worsens with older African-American K-12 students. Nationally, African-American students are suspended almost four times more than white students, and they're greatly, of course, underrepresented in nearly every type of advanced academic program. If we understand the dire consequences of our country's cultural stories, on marginalized communities and students, what can we do about it? How can we seek equitable outcomes for all of our students? Since most of the beliefs attached to the stereotypic stories we've breathed in all of our lives operate at a level below consciousness, is there any hope that we might rid, get rid of the subconscious beliefs driving negative stereotypes, lowered expectations, and lowered performance? I believe there is, and I look to neuroscience research to figure out why. Neuroscience research suggests that we don't have to get rid of old stories. We just have to create new ones. Belief in the new stories automatically replaces the old ones. So we have to inundate the conscious mind with different visions and ideas in order to reprogram the subconscious mind. We have to give students the psychological space to allow them to utilize their full brain power to engage in academic content. So there is some research that the psychologists were doing to try to figure out how to reduce stereotype threat, mostly by changing the stories that the test takers are exposed to, reprogramming their subconscious. When the story made the test taker believe that he or she belongs like the research I gave you, in the group that is expected to do well, then that is what happens. A sense of belongingness in, is what Steele identified made all the difference for black students on elite campuses where they are most likely to feel like outsiders. Belongingness is a major element of dropping out of school as well. Nilda Flores Gonzalez looked at the difference between those who dropped out and those who stayed in school and the biggest difference was those who stayed in school felt that in elementary school, they had a warm sense of feeling that they belonged in that space, that they were meant to be educator, uh, meant to be scholars, that they were expected to do well, and that school belonged to them. Those who dropped out didn't have that. So I've come to the conclusion that dropouts start really in kindergarten. So in order to see how changing the story and creating a sense of belonging are actualized, researchers conducted a, an amazing study because it's so simple. Um, before I get into that, uh, in public school, middle schools. So they are dealing with, they reduce the negative consequences of the stereotypes students are dealing with of their sense of identity threat. African American and other marginalized students may face threats to their identity as scholars in classrooms. In my work, I see this phenomenon on a regular basis. Indeed, that's where the title of the last book came from, 
a child said to a tutor, black people don't, Miss, Miss L, why are you trying to teach me multiplication? Black people don't multiply. Black people just add and subtract. White people multiply. Now, it's pretty clear to me that no adult ever said that to this child. But this child has internalized this belief by living in this country, which gets to show all of us how the stories, the subconscious acceptance of the stories of this country is affecting not only the adults, but also the children we're trying to teach. A black eighth grader said to his young teacher one day, so Miss L, they made us, I mean Miss uh, Summers, they made us the slaves because we were dumb, right? And another student in a school rated triple F by the state of Florida said they put us in F schools because they think we're F people. So researchers Jeff Cohen and Julio Garcia wondered if simply giving uh, ability stereotype public school students a chance to develop a self-affirming narrative, a positive story in the school setting could reduce the threat they felt in the classroom and increase their sense of belonging. And if it did, would that improve their academic performance? So close to the beginning of the school year in a middle school, the researchers went to several racially integrated seventh grade classrooms near Hartford, Connecticut, and asked teachers to give each student in their classroom an envelope with his or her name on it. Instructions in the envelope asked half of the students, randomly selected, to write down their two or three most important values. For example, family relationships, friendships, being good at music, their religion, etc. And then write a brief paragraph about why these values were important to them. That is, to put these value statements in the form of a personal story. This took about 15 minutes, and then they put what they had written back into the envelope and handed it to the teacher. Later in the school year, they did a few follow-up writing exercises just like this. I don't think, I don't even know if the teacher read them. They just put them into the envelopes. A control group was asked to write about values they did not find important, but others might. Thus, all students wrote about values, but only some wrote a personally affirming narrative. The results were dramatic. The experimental group, those who wrote stories affirming their personal and community values, showed increased performance as compared to their performance in the first three weeks of school. Those with the lowest early performance increased the most. By contrast, the grades of the black students in the no affirmation control group kept going down, making the racial achievement gap in these classrooms even wider over the course of the school term. Follow-up research showed that higher achievement and thus smaller gap with white students lasted for two years from that one year of, of uh, writing stories, three, three, time, three or four times during the year. White students, and not just in the subject, it was also across all subject areas, not just in the class, the subject areas where they did the writing. White students showed no difference in performance no matter what group they were in, presumably because their intellectual identities were not under question in the classroom setting. So writing stories with positive self-affirmations about one's identity leads to higher school performance. And that's why these children, who you saw up here, they have personal stories being shared with them all the time. They are affirming who they are. They're affirming uh, their communities and therefore they are succeeding. So what can we do? I'm gonna to have to speed through some of these, but this is what I have been developing, culturally affirming instruction. If there's, whatever the curricular content is, it should be connected to students' cultural and intellectual legacy, connected to students' lived experiences, of value outside the classroom, and connected to the student's community. And to figure out a way to be able to make that happen with as, in as many blocks as we can find. So unfortunately, underperforming students don't, you, you have to know who the students are in order to be able to do this. You have to have an anthropological orientation toward education as a teacher in order to be able to do these have this related to content. 
Unfortunately, they frequently, that doesn't happen. Stories of black inferiority subconsciously manifest themselves within the belief systems of both educators and students and result in teachers expecting less of African-American students and consequently teaching less. Uh, one uh, educator said earlier today that the teachers were saying, I'm not teaching them until they act like they deserve to be taught. Uh, African-American students then expect to fail, and so they give up before they even try. So I'm going to just try to share quickly an example of how you put all that kind of, of way somewhat people put this into uh, actuality. Petra Hendry was a professor at LSU who managed to treat marginally marginalized African-American students as scholars at the same time she connected to their history and communities. McKinley High School is the first public school for black students in the region in around Baton Rouge. So they did an oral history project. Any remediation done during that time was done in the context of the bigger, bigger picture. Um, they were told they were university researchers and their work was actually put in LSU's uh, research oral history research library. And they were reading archival documents. They were interviewing um, people who had been teachers or people who had been students at the school. They transcribed tapes. And of course, in transcribing tapes, you're spelling, you, you learn spelling, word choice, decisions about written grammar, punctuation, capitalization paragraphing, how to gloss spoken words to written context, all the skills that might be included in a remedial program, but without the stigma. So I am fascinated with, this was another example, the O oh Freedom is a book where students, uh, middle school students interviewed people in their community about the civil rights movement. And their, their interviews were printed in the book, which is available actually uh, on, uh, pub, their teachers got it published. So when teachers in low income racially isolated schools believe their students can learn and make them know it, when they push students to excel, give them clear cut strategies to reach a high standard, and assistance when they get stuck, when they build relationships based on students' intellectual competence, competence and goodness, when the students can find aspects of who they are in the classroom and thus feel a sense of belonging, then I think we can un undo the identity threat. So I want to end with the story. So a little boy is playing, uh, goes out to play basketball. And the first day he goes, he doesn't get any baskets. He goes to the community center. The next day, he goes and he gets two out of 20. Next day, he goes and he gets four out of 20. And he keeps getting better and better. Why did he keep getting better? Practice is what you typically say. But the bigger question is, why in the face of apparent failure does he keep trying? What causes his persistence when at school the first sign of failure causes withdrawal, disidentification with school? What story is he telling himself in basketball that makes him keep trying? Perhaps his story goes like this. I know I can do better if I keep trying. I know I can because I see so many people who look like me who are successful at this. If I become good, I know I will get accolades from my peers and community. I will fit in. Getting better will help me become a more valued member of a group. The better I become, the more I can contribute to the team. Contrast that to his school story. The world says I'm dumb, so there's no use in trying. I don't know people who I look like and relate to who are good at this. If I become good, my peers may reject me. I'm in this alone. No one will benefit if I get better. I'm suggesting we have the capacity to change the story by, like Steele suggests, adjusting the environment. The new story. 
I'm smart and I know people who look like me are smart because my school regularly introduces me to the brilliance of those individuals from the past and the present, which I'm sure these, this school does. I work collaboratively to achieve a clear goal so that my individual improvement brings success to my group, as in basketball. I know my peers and community will praise me for my improvements because the school organizes regular academic expos, not just sports events, in which I display what I've accomplished to my community. And everybody gets to display, not just the best. If I am not immediately successful, my teachers in school let me know that it is only because I need more practice, not because I can't do it. I know I'm smart because everybody and everything at my school is organized to tell me so. Perhaps if we can help schools learn more from basketball, then we might come to craft stories that create for teachers, students, and the society at large the expectation that black and brown children should not only excel at sports, but that they are also designed to excel in all things academic, to create for our students, as I have come to call it, culturally affirming identities of excellence. Thank you. We have time for two or three questions. Please stand if you have a question and we will get a microphone to you. Questions or comments? Hey, um, is that on? Uh, I'm a pre-service teacher, and last week I went and visited an uh, elementary school here in a gentrifying neighborhood. Um, and the class I visited was mostly English language learners from like seven different languages in one class. Um, and I was observing the homeroom, and they were doing a, uh, a reading lesson. And the first part of the lesson was very direct instruction. The teacher was pretty much yelling at these students, telling them what exactly they need to do. And I know that you've written a little bit about um, direct instruction and sort of expressing your power in these situations. And I'm just curious a little bit about what you think, you know, it, when, when we set these expectations for, for these children, especially English language learners, um, we're, are, are we also telling teachers that like we need to really dig into these kids? And what, what do we do about the professional development for these ideas? Because I'm, I'm curious whether or not teachers are, are getting it, and I think it has a lot to do with what you said about this whole subconscious ideas of what kids can do and what can't, they can't do. How can we use like, professional development to help teachers that are already teaching to um, help these students in a better way, if that makes any sense? Okay, there are a lot of, I, I can't answer that because I don't know what's going on in the school. There are times when people are yelling at kids and that what they're yelling is good stuff and their, their cultural framework is to yell. For example, you are too smart to be giving me this kind of work. You better get on it because I know how smart you are. Now, somebody hearing the yelling may, make, make, may make some assumptions that this is a mean, terrible teacher, but the kids, if the teachers and kids share a cultural framework, that may not be a problem. That may be something that is very good for them to do. Um, if you're talking about children who speak, who are second language learners, and the teachers don't know, how, they may not know how, are, are they teachers who were, skill, were taught to teach second language learners, or were they just second language learners? OK. So I would try to find out from them what, what it is that they were trying to accomplish in that. And I don't know what kind of, of instruction that they, the teachers have been, been given. Um, they may have been told to speak loudly. I have no idea. Um, I can, but I would need, my experience is I need to be in the setting to be able to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, yes, I think there does need to be more PD for teachers to understand some of these issues and that I'm raising 
And a lot of that is not just professional development, but I think it has to do with folk getting together and talking about specific kids, reading books together, having, because just talking at someone doesn't, my experience never does it. It's when they kind of come, uh, given the, it's just like with kids, when you give them enough information so they get to understand what it is themselves. Uh, I think probably they need to do a lot more with project-based learning like the one I talked about and kids will learn uh, language as a result of doing that. But there, I think there are a lot of layers to your question that I'd need a lot more knowledge about. Thank you, though. Dr. Delpit. Um, my name is Tamara Durant and I work for Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, previously, I worked at a charter school in New Orleans and um, it was a high school. And the way we motivated students around being successful in the ACT was kind of by saying, um, this is what your white counterparts are doing. This is what people expect of you. We would show them data from schools that look like ours to say this is how we're performing, but we can beat the odds. And when you started talking about stereotype threat, it really spoke to me like, wow, we were doing our students a huge disservice by pumping them up before a test with this type of data. But um, how would you suggest motivating student, students in a community where that success on a gatekeeper like the ACT isn't common, you know, where they are underperforming, for back of a, lack of a better word, what would your, your advice be to a school like that to students or to teachers or school leaders in that situation? Okay, what we have to do is change the way the kids are viewing themselves because right now what they're viewing, they're thinking of themselves as incompetent, not able to do it. The way you change that, I believe, is have students do projects like the one I was talking about, the oral history project. I didn't get it, it wasn't, there wasn't time to give you more information about it. But one of the things the kids did was they perform, they presented their information to the community. They presented their information even at AERA. And so they began to have a different mindset about who they were and who they were capable of. That's the idea of getting a different story, of giving kids another story about themselves, giving teachers another story about the kids. So it doesn't start at test time. It starts before test time. We think a lot that we need to teach directly to the test. My experience is if you teach the way I'm talking about and you also provide them with, within doing that, teaching them what they need to know for the test, but also do, they need to know for the project that they're working on, then you, they can ground the information into something that makes sense for them. My mother was an amazing teacher she died three years ago at 99. And she said, I, will nev I never teach my students anything that I cannot justify them learning. Mm -hmm. And that, that does not have a real value in life or in uh, careers later. She would invite people in to talk about math, uh, the math that they used in their jobs and then they would look at that in the context of, of math teaching. So I think it, it's presenting, um, having students learn a very different notion of who they are. Okay. Thank you.
Um, I mean, I have to convince them. I mean, I have to convince them that they're smart. I have to give them opportunities to do things to show that they're smart, like in uh, working on projects and things that they have to present. Um, I worked with um, the algebra project, and one of the things that the algebra project does is they have their children uh, have math programs for parents where the ch kids are teaching the parents what they've learned. As soon as you're in the position of being a teacher, of being uh, an instructor for younger children, all of that gives you a different story. I'm not going to just stand up and tell you, you know, tell them that they're different. I have to give them experiences to be engaged in that allow them to know that they are, that they can do a lot more and that they take ownership of. It's the issue of taking ownership of it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me once again in thanking Professor Lisa Delpit. Thank you. And so, as you travel on the plane, we have a gift for you. We want you to take it on the plane with you. You may have to talk to the plane. <laughs> oh, wow, that's beautiful. We'll mail it to you. We'll mail it to you. <laughs> All right, please hang with us. We are almost there, almost there. When the center was founded in 2002, it was from the vision of one man and his commitment to improving urban education, former Dean Alice Allen Lesko. In his honor, the Allen Lesko Award for Excellence in Urban Education is presented to an educator, leader, community member, or organization that or who demonstrates outstanding work and commitment to innovation and improvement in urban education. Today, we are fortunate to honor two individuals, and, I'm sorry, one individual and two organizations whose work demonstrates this award. This afternoon, the first recipient of the Allen Lesko Award is Provost Patricia Beeson. As Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor, Dr. Patty Beeson is the Chief Academic Officer of the University. She works closely with Chancellor Gallagher, initiating and promoting the university's commitment to excellence in education and research. Prior to being appointed to Provost in 2010, she built a strong, distinguished research career as a faculty member in economics, specializing in urban, regional, and labor, labor economics, particularly focused on higher education's growth and development of local and regional communities. Dr. Beeson's interest in supporting innovation and entrepreneurship led to the development of the university's uh, Innovation Institute in 2012, and more recently, the creation of the new School of Computing and Information to lead Pitt's expanding research and teaching focus in data sciences. To be clear, Dean, B Dean Beeson, Provost Beeson, actually she, she developed a school here uh, at the university, right? Her tenure as provost has seen the university continue to rise to prominence from educational and research programs to attracting the quote unquote best and brightest and faculty from across the world we are eternally grateful to her for all the support she has provided to the Center for Urban Education. I can say personally that we have, and we had a friend, we had a friend, we have a friend in Provost Beeson. Unfortunately, Provost Beeson cannot be with us today, but please join me in congratulating Provost Beeson in her absence.
We are fortunate to have with us Vice Provost for Graduate Studies, Provost Alberta, and I cannot pronounce your last name, Spraja, you see why I can't pronounce the last name? Uh, here from the Provost's office, so please come up, Provost Alberta. One Nation. All right. Kevin McNair, Lord Cheatham, and Sam Morant Jr. met when the Heinz Endowment and Steck selected them to serve in the 2013 cohort of the Heinz Fellows Program. Their focus was on assisting African American students to get them to take advantage of the Pittsburgh Promise. With this in mind, they contributed to positive cultural shifts of the school community through academic and, so, and social skill mentoring of African American students. As the two-year fellowship drew to a close, Cheetah, McNair, and Morant created One Nation Mentoring. One Nation's m mission is to encourage positive behavior and healthy life decision by providing, providing a holistic approach toward changing the negative narrative of African American youth. This is embodied in their motto, think great, Act great, be great. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating One Nation as a 2018 recipient of the Alan Lescola Award for Urban Education. <laughs> Pride program, pride program. Pride is a multi-component program designed to support African-American children's positive racial identity development. You know, I was, I'm gonna veer off for here, here for just one second. Um, you know, when I, I do, I'm a race researcher. That's what I do, unapologetically. And you know, I, I was, when, I, when I do talks across the country, people often ask me, well, why am I focusing on, on black students? And, I say unapologetically, I can focus on whoever I want to focus on. <laughs> okay, back to the script. All right, uh, African American children's positive racial identity development. Uh, they also work to build skills and knowledge among adults around race and young children and increase community awareness about the ways race impacts children. Housed in the University of Pittsburgh's Office of Child Development and born out of a 2013 study titled Positive Racial Identity Development in Early Childhood, Understanding Pride in Pittsburgh, the program's efforts reach teachers, parents, caregivers, and community members. Led by Pride Director, Dr. Aisha White, <laughs> Director of Engagement, Medina Jackson, and principal investigator, Dr. Sh Sh uh, Shannon Wanless. The, <laughs> wow. the Pride team engages the community through celebrating the arts, through professional development training for organizations and schools, pop-up arts festivals, a six-session parent village curriculum, a biannual speaker series, and research and evaluation of all of these projects. Please join me in a warm applause for the 2018 Alan Let's Go awardees, the Pride Program. <laughs> it's like the Academy Awards, sir.
All right, let's give them a hand. One more hand and say Tech Justice. And now I invite Professor Lori Delaley O'Connor to the front for some final announcements. Stay with us. We're almost there. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. So before you get to hear a few announcements, I would be remiss if I didn't actually turn it over right now um, to our former dean, Alan Leskold, who'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Lori. You know, uh, an awful lot of good stuff gets done by the people in this room. Uh, and just about every person that's been doing that good stuff has been recognized today, except for one person, and that's Rich. Uh, so don't go too far away, Rich. to uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The architect of that building, Christopher Wren, happens to be buried there, but that's really not important. There's a plaque there, <laughs> has his name on it, and it says in Latin underneath, if you're looking for his monument, look around you. And I think that's the way really we need to talk about Rich. If you're looking for what Rich has done, Rich's accomplishments here in Pittsburgh, look around you. Look at the people that just got awards. Look at the people that are the Heinz Fellows. Look at the people that are in, in uh, university prep school. Look at all the different activities, not only in the community, but in building a stronger scholarly base for urban education. Look around you because all of that is part of the recognition, part of the monument, part of the uh, accomplishment uh, of my esteemed colleague, Rich Milner. It's a real pleasure to uh, pass on uh, the Alan Leskold Award to the person that probably deserves it much more than Alan Leskold ever did, and that's Rich Milner. Thank you for taking that moment with us. So I'm actually going to need somebody to do the clicker for me. <laughs> we have a full house here. And as you know, and as Alan said, you know, look around you and look to the events that we have to see what Rich and what the team at the Center for the Urban Education is doing. And we want to invite you and the people that aren't in this room that you know want and need to be here um, to our upcoming Reflection into Action. Um, that's next Tuesday, March 27th, as we work to move what we heard here from Dr. Delpit into action in, in our Pittsburgh community. This will be held from 4 to 6 at Urban Academy Charter School, and if you go to our website, you can learn more um, information, and we hope to see you all there, because we want to continue this conversation. We want to think about it for here. In addition, we have, uh, as many of you have joined us for our Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series, which continues next week with a talk from visiting scholars Lynette Mawinney and Emery Petschauer, and concludes on April 5th with a session from Dr. Mark Gooden. And then finally, we are delighted, the newly launched website, to announce this year's Q Summer Educator Forum. I know many folks in this room have joined us um, for the last two amazing summer educator forums, We've expanded our workshop offerings this year and have a slate of wonderful speakers lined up. We've streamlined the res registration process and we're offering discounts for groups. So tell your colleagues, tell your administrators, mark your calendars, and join us on June 26th and 27th here at Pitt. We're even taking care of parking, which you know is no easy feat here in Oakland. So, 
Yeah, even Beckett's clapping for that right back there. Um, but early bird registration is open now, so if you go to q.pit.edu slash QCEF, you'll be able to learn more and register. So thank you everyone for joining us, and we hope that you'll stay for the reception. Thank you. Good evening.